Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome into Tom Curran's Patriots Talk podcast. I'm Tom Curran. We have a great show here. Super Bowl 55 dead ahead, and we have our friend Rodney Harrison, former Patriots, current NBC Sports analyst, to jump on with us. And after Rodney, we're going to get Phil Perry in here to talk about all of the happenings on the quarterback carousel, and there are plenty. All that and more. No, all that on this Patriots Talk podcast. This special Super Bowl week episode of Patriots Talk is presented by Locker Room App, a place for live audio conversations about the sports you care about. All right, and here is our guy, looking like Run DMC circa 1986. <laughs> it's Rodney Harrison. How, how are you, buddy? What's up, Tom, man? Good to see you. It's great to see you, too. And um, let's just jump right into it, because I'm sure you're going through the car wash with a million people wanting to talk to you this week. But as I look at Tom Brady, over the years, you keep hearing people say, Father Time wins every time. I have a theory. He's already beaten Father Time. The W was already in his corner. It's unprecedented. Yeah, the fact that he's still playing football at 43, I think it shows that, you know, he's beat Father Time. And the fact that he's playing at such a high level, I mean, it really, it's really a credit to his work ethic, his discipline, his mental toughness. No one works like Tom. No one has the discipline that Tom Brady has. Everyone talks about him being the GOAT on the field, where in order to be the GOAT on the field, you have to be the GOAT off the field. And Tom is the GOAT off the field. We saw LeBron James, his work ethic. Tiger Woods, his work ethic. Tom has this incredible incredible ability to go away, um, to isolate himself, separate himself, and really mentally take himself to the next level. It's, it's, it's something that we really hadn't seen much of. When you talk about Tiger and Michael Jordan and Kobe and those guys, you see it in LeBron, but you don't see it from everyday average people. And that's why Tom is considered the GOAT. You know, what's funny is you mentioned that about the sequestering himself. He has kicked Giselle and the kids probably very gently out of the house in Tampa. He said he yeah. has been by himself for 12 days. It just goes to exactly what you're talking about. Um, with, with the situation, talking X's and O's a little bit, as we see the Kansas City Chiefs offensive line racked by some injuries and some COVID uncertainty, I'm starting to think, Rodney, they might pull this off. Oh, I'm, I'm picking Brady. I'm not picking against him. I'm picking the guy that helped me win two Super Bowl rings. And you think about Patrick Mahomes, he's great. He's this, he's that. He's, he's the young phenom. But Tom has that experience. Mm -hmm. And you talk about, you know, this has been his 10th Super Bowl. It's like another game to him in a sense because he's played it so often. And I just think with his level of preparation, um, his insight, and just the fact that he inspires so many of those guys in the locker room, I'm picking Tampa Bay to win. Let's talk a little Patriots. So we got Tom, and he parachuted into a great situation for himself in Tampa Bay. Meanwhile, the Patriots are in a little bit of a rebuild. And Bill is in the crosshairs for, for criticism in the way he's drafted and, you know, saying he wanted to move on from Tom and doing so. Do you think the heat that Bill is taking for where the team is right now is deserved? Well, it happens. It happens. That's what happens when you've been on top for 20 years, basically. You've been you've been dominating for the last two decades. And all of a sudden, I used to hear when we play, like, man, I'm so tired of the Patriots. I can't wait till you guys leave. I can't wait till Tom Brady falls off the cliff. You guys are going to be done. People want to see this because they want to see how coach responds and how the Patriot respond and things like that. But we've had, as a Patriots organization, they've had so much success over two decades, it's like everybody's sitting back waiting for him to crumble. But I tell you this about Coach Belichick, and Tom said it last night when he was interviewing. He said he would not be here. He would not be in this position in his career if it weren't for Coach Belichick. So it just kills me the fact that Coach Belichick is the one that saw what he saw in Tom Brady. Coach Belichick was the one that believed in Tom. He was the one that set the system around Tom. So he put Tom in a great position to have success over two decades. So I don't know why people are always trying to pin 
Bill versus Tom because Bill would not be the coach that he is if he didn't have Tom and vice versa. Tom would not be the player that he is if he didn't have Bill. So they work well together. Um, you know, Coach Belichick, he's he's hit with a situation where he has to show that he can rebuild, that he can draft, that he can find a quarterback. That's his situation. Mm -hmm. And until he fix it, there's going to be people on the outside laughing, making fun, harassing them, doing everything. But if your team is losing, that's what you deserve. So you get what you deserve in this league. When you say he's got to find a quarterback, what we're seeing this week and what we might see for the next couple of years is he was right there. He was playing for you, Bill. He'd been playing for you for 20 years. Do you feel at all that Bill might have pulled the ripcord too early? It's in his nature. You saw it a million times. He wants to get out on guys early. He wants to reboot. He wants to rebuild. Well, that's his fault. I mean, that's his situation. That's his problem. That's his priority. That's what happens. When you give up on a guy like a Tom Brady, you know what's inside of him. You've seen it for 20 years. You know what's deep down inside Tom. Tom's going to come back. He's going to train harder. He's going to be more focused. He's going to be more in tune. He's going to try to take everything to the next level because you know he's the most competitive guy that you've ever been around. He, that's how Tom is. Tom is a nice guy. He's handsome. He's articulate. He knows how to say the right thing. But at the end of the day, he want to rip, rip your freaking heart out of you. I know Tom. I've had conversations with him. You think it bothers Bill to see Tom succeed Not on at a all. professional level? I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so because if I'm Bill, I'm sitting back almost like a proud father. Mm -hmm. You know what? I'm really proud of that guy because how could you not like Tom Brady? Yeah, you can disagree on schemes and X's and O's and things like that, but how could you not like him when all he makes it everything about the team? It's never about Brady. It's never been about him. It's always been about the team. And that's why his teammates, that's why Danny Amendola, even though I agree to disagree with Danny Amendola on some things. That's why teammates say things like that about Tom because they love him so much because he's just a good guy. It's a, it's a really interesting fraternity of guys who've had so much success in the league, who came up, um, whether it's Danny Amendola or you or Seymour or Ty Law or Tom, it's a, it is a program unlike any other in the NFL in that you guys are going to follow along. And I bet if you all got together, there'd be, 170 different opinions about Bill. But you know what? I would say they might be 170 different opinions, but it's all going to be centered around the same thing, the same type of things, as far as the discipline, as far as him being um, open-minded, as far as him being a, a, a coach that's two, three steps ahead of a situation, all those different things, man. But, you know, at the end of the day, I've never had a player come up to me and just say, I hate Bill Belichick. I've mm -hmm. never had a player say that. They always say, well, I wish he would have did this or I wish he would have done that. But they never say they hate Bill Belichick or that he's not a great coach. Which is good, which is good, because I think that that perception, while I mean, I've scrutinized the drafts, I've, you know. And let me just say this. Let me just say this. And Matthew Stafford, I heard him come out and say he would go anywhere other than the Patriots. and stuff. But, you know. You talk about physical toughness is one thing and Matthew Stafford is a tough guy. But my thing is, you know maybe he's not ready to step up and lead the Patriots because it's a lot of um, pressure being a Patriots quarterback. We saw that with Tom. We saw that with Cam. And, you know, for a guy like Matthew Stafford, who's played inside of a dome, he doesn't want any of that cold weather. He doesn't want to deal with that. He doesn't want to deal with coaching and changing philosophies and things. He's a guy that's stuck in his own ways. So I, I, I understand what he meant and what he said, but, um, you know, he's, yeah. he's, not, he's not the right guy for the situation anyway. Jimmy G, would he be the right guy if the San Francisco 49ers can find a solution that they think is better than him and Jimmy G was cut loose? Absolutely. He's, he's going to be a heck of a lot better um, situated for that moment than, say, somebody else because he knows Bill. He's comfortable with Josh. He knows their system. So I would say Dim Jimmy G is definitely a viable option. You're not concerned about the fact he can be a little bit brittle. Of course I, mean, I am. Of course I am. But what do you have out here? You got garbage out here. You don't have anything. You don't have much. So when you do get a great quarterback, when you do get somebody special, you sign them up for 10 or 15 years like Kansas City did Patrick Mahomes. You know, you have to really embrace that quarterback because when you think about the personality of the team, a lot of times, yeah, it comes from the coach, but it really comes from the quarterback. And when a team can sense that your quarterback is tough, he's unselfish, you know, he's willing to come in early, leave late, do all the little things and make it not about him, 
then you have a guy like Tom Brady or Patrick Mahomes, and n- now you're set for the next and, 10, 12 years. You know, that's what's wild is as poorly as Cam Newton threw the ball, and I don't know if he'll ever throw it as well again as he used to, I did feel as if that was a part of the reason that Bill was so f- praising of him all the way through. He's giving us toughness. He's giving us, you know, uh, killing his own ego to do what he can do here. He's doing it all for less. Would you be stunned if Bill said, you know what, come back, Cam. We'll do it again. That'd be the worst decision he's ever made. That would be the worst decision he ever made because now you're not being fair to your team. Mm -hmm. You're not being fair to your team. When I saw what I saw with Cam, every time I saw Cam play pretty much, I was hurt because I was a guy that believed in Cam. And when you see him drop back and he continues to throw the ball into the ground, throw it five feet or at five yards above somebody else, you're like, what are you doing, Cam? Mm -hmm. Trust me, we're all fans. And yeah, we're Patriot fans, but we're football fans. We want to see these young men do well in their lives and in their livelihood. And so everybody was sitting back rooting for Cam. A lot of people were sitting back rooting for Cam. But yeah, I mean, I, I would say this. You have to find a quarterback. And it would be a terrible mistake for Bill Belichick to bring Cam back because Cam can't play football anymore. He just can't play quarterback in the National Football League. Yeah, it's and it's probably not coming back, God bless him. But hopefully he gets in the right situation. Maybe as a backup, I can realize that he can be a changeup guy. It's it's got to be hard to push away. How hard was it for you to push away? After after suffering some of my injuries that I suffered, I just got to a point because I was a guy that gave everything all the time to football. And when I went down with my, my last injury, I was like, I'm just done. I'm tired. It's been 15 years. I've done okay. You know, it's time to move on. And NBC has been a great spot for you. I mean, it's, it's a, a, did you think you'd be there, you know, a decade plus at this point? I did not. Um, you know, I've always, you know, when I was playing, I was always in the media trying to respect you guys, give you time, and, and really be that conduit, you know, between the fans and what's going on on the football field to you guys so you can be able to write the messages and, and you know, get, get the word out there. So um, I've always tried to show – a level of respect. And I never knew what was going to happen after that. I said, okay, I was planning on going back to school, maybe go get my master's, maybe coach or something like that. And it's been 12 years. I just finished my 12th year here at NBC. It's been, it's been amazing. I mean, imagine you coaching. Could you, I mean, you have young men who are 14 and 17. You have a a young daughter. Uh, You have an older daughter who's a nurse. How would players respond to coach Rodney? I think the most, I think the most, I think the most important thing is, you know, I would be myself. I'm a very honest guy. I'm a very, um, I'm a, I'm a guy that wants to speak positive in in young men's lives. And I know the kids now because I've been around them. My sons, I have sons and I see how the kids are. You're not going to go and say, Hey, we're going to rip this. We're going to run through a brick wall and we're going to do this. Like the Dan Campbell. You remember the Dan Campbell? Yeah, yeah. Fight their kneecap. Man, these kids, these kids ain't going for that. They don't want no part of that. You have to coach and teach and talk to them a different way. And, and, and my thing is this, I've been coaching for a long time, but I know this, as long as you respect people and you talk to them and you encourage them and you're positive, they'll listen. And when I coach my boys, I have three, it got to a point where 12, 13, 14, 15, you realize they actually want the discipline. They want some hard lines and boundaries set up for them. And this is how it's going to be. And this is how we're going to do it. And that is what amazed me. So, you know, it's that honesty too. I don't mean to go too far afield here. No, no, you're right. You're right. Absolutely. You know, they, they like to be coached hard as long as it's with a purpose and respectful. It's interesting as hell. It's the, you get the psychology of things you always did, I think, as a player. And when we look at the psychology of this particular game, do you think that Tom Brady's teammates are going to be able to draft off of his experience and he will lift all boats? Brother, if you saw JPP the other day interviewing, this team is relaxed, they're confident. And you got to remember, they're, Kansas City's they're missing both their tackles. Mm-hmm. And the, a big part of the strength of the Tampa Bay defense is are their ends and the speed that they have. So, yeah, you can expect Andy Reid a lot of um, screens, a lot of quick stuff, some running, you know, and all the creativity. And if I'm Todd Bowles, I come out basic. I say, you know what, I'm going to keep two safeties back. I'm going to make sure that I keep someone over Tyreek Hill because he burned us the first game yep. for 13 for 269. I can't let him get me. And then kind of see where the game is going. 
And then you, I think you'll see Todd Bowles start to mix in some blitzes, some different pressures, and um, some different looks. But yeah, but that it's going to come down to Tom is going to be able to score on that defense. The question is, which quarterback is going to make that big mistake? Mm-hmm. You know, who's going to make that big mistake throwing a ball down the field? And that's what the game's going to come down to. Last question, go inside the mind of Rodney Harrison. What's the most indelible Super Bowl memory you have from the three? What Four. the hell does indelible mean? Indelible means you can't get it out. Of, like indelible ink, you can't get it out. Like indelible memory. Like this is an image in my head of what the Super Bowl is all about that's stuck in there. When I think Super Bowl, I close my eyes. I see this image. Oh, uh, me walking off the field, me and my teammates walking off the field with all the confetti on my head. And, and, and really, okay, all, yeah, being ready to shove it up the, um, to charge his butt, basically. <laughs> 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 For them to get rid of me, when I put everything on the line, I put my body, my mind, everything, every single thing, all my heart, just everything. I left everything out on the field. And for them to cut me the way they cut me, I appreciate it because it just really took me to another, another level of focus, of humility, and of, of passion. So I thank the Chargers for that. But yeah, every time I walk off that field and I feel that confetti and I see that confetti come off my teammates and my head, yeah, it reminds me of the Chargers, definitely. All right, it's good to see you were able to put that behind you. <laughs> you know I remember yeah. everything. Nobody like them. Hey, Rodney, thank you so much. Enjoy yourself. Enjoy your family. Enjoy the offseason. Tom, you are you are a blessing, man. Peace out, my brother. Woo! Smoking. That's some smoking insight from Rodney Harrison. Now, um, we're going to bring Phil in, and we have the Stafford situation to get to. We get Jimmy G to get to. We have the Senior Bowl to get to and Mac Jones. We have just a ton of things to discuss with our guy, So let's bring him in right now. And here he is now, Phil Perry. How you doing, my guy? I'm doing great, doing great. Uh, Getting fired up for this Super Bowl. Getting fired up for uh, what might be coming with the the Patriots quarterback spot, Tom, because we've been talking a lot about quarterbacks the last few days, and my head is actually spinning uh, on the number of options that uh, we should be pursuing in our minds just so we're prepared there's a lot of balls in the air always with the Patriots in early February and anybody who was under the assumption that it would be quieter in 2021 because they weren't in the Super Bowl, mistaken, Phil. Yeah, mistaken. A couple guys out here are pretty mistaken. Looking for time off, not coming soon. That's okay. We love the grind. Love it. Uh, Before we get into Matt Stafford, I'm going to give you the quick skinny that I have today for quick slants that I'm going to say in my spiel. And then I want to just ride you like a mule for the rest of the pod. Okay. Um, just, you know, a beast of burden. Three, two, one. I don't know why I did that. I usually count that down when we're editing, but either, either way, uh, my take on Stafford is this. So we didn't want to come here. Good. The Patriots don't need to be shopping in that particular store right now anyway. Given that Albert Breer reported just a second round pick at a player was the offer of the Patriots, I'm fine with that. I think that's 100% where they should be because they're not in the same spot as the Rams, Phil. The Rams are a team, <laughs> hit my mic, that are basically on the cusp of the threshold. The Patriots are not. So signing up for a 33-year-old quarterback who's going to take up $20 million in cap space and may or not may not be real good in two years doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It is time to build and check this out. The Patriots draft picks since 2012 when Hightower and Jones came in. 2013, first round pick, none. 2014, first rounder, Dominique Easley, 15, Malcolm Brown, 16, none, 17, none, 18, Isaiah Wynn and Sony Michelle. One guy doesn't play, the other guy plays okay. 2019, Nikhil Harry, he's not very good. 2020, none. They need to get into the draft. They have to treat their first round picks in a different way than other teams do. So when you look at the first iteration of the Patriots dynasty being built on first rounders and draft picks and the second the same way, it's okay to say, no go on Matt Stafford and just make a modest offer. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think you would be mistaken if you look at the Patriots offer for Stafford and say, well, they weren't even really in it anyway. A second and a player? Bill must not value the quarterback position. Guess we're going to go in for another Jarrett Stidham in the fourth round this year of the draft. Oh boy, get ready, get excited for that. (laughs) I don't necessarily think that's the case. I think you put it perfectly in the Rams. 
to look at the other side of this, they kind of did what the Patriots did to some extent with, say, Brandon Cooks, trading away that first round mm-hmm. pick to get somebody who's going to help you for a year, maybe two at most. And that's kind of where the Rams are because their roster is in such a place that they can actually compete. To me, Tom, I wonder if Stafford getting dealt for what he got dealt for. And I know Goff being part of the package complicates it a little bit. Is he a negative asset? Does mm-hmm. he actually have value? As Peter Schrager from NFL Network reported, there were teams that are actually interested in trading something away for Jared Goff because they view him as a starting quarterback. If that's the case, by the way, I'm not sure the Rams really did well enough here because, you know, maybe um, they could have helped out their rod that, you know, they didn't have to see so much go out just to get Matthew Stafford back, who I think is good, but he's, he's a slightly above average quarterback. Yeah. But what does this do Tom to the rest of the quarterback market? What does it do to a guy that I think a lot of us view as, as pretty average when he's healthy in Jimmy Garoppolo, like Stafford's a better player than Garoppolo, but how much better? I mean, that guy just, you know, he just was part of a deal that sent two first round picks back to his old team. Does this in some way impact that Garoppolo market? And then how does that impact the Patriots? How much should they be willing to give up for that guy. Because as you mentioned, they have so many holes to fill to me, even for a quarterback, if it's somebody of Jimmy Garoppolo's ilk, I don't want to give away a valuable pick for that because that pick is a, is a good young player, hopefully who's on my roster for four or five years. When you look at Jimmy too, here's the thing. I, I, I wish and hope that these trades and moves can be siloed. This is not like a street where if my house sells for this, it's going to impact your house, but it kind of is. But in the Rams case, you had McVay lusting for Stafford because there seems to have been a relationship. The two were in Cabo San Lucas. We got to go there sometime. I have no idea where that place is, but people. Sounds great. Sounds great. Um, They were in Cabo. So they had that affinity. They had to unload Goff by hook or by crook. They'd already alienated him. So whatever they could give up, sounded like to me, they were good to do. But in the Jimmy Garoppolo or even the Deshaun Watson conversation, you can't expect other teams to be drunken sailors. Now, maybe they will for Watson, but I don't know if they will necessarily for Jimmy Garoppolo. And that you know leads me to a conversation. I do want to get to whether or not we believe that the Stafford, ah, I'm not going to New England situation is a red flag or not. But before we do that, will Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch and Jed York feel as if there is a quid pro quo in order to sending Jimmy Garoppolo back to Bill Belichick for less than the same way the lions wanted to work with Stafford to send him to a nice home. And the same way Bill Belichick wanted to send Jimmy to a nice home. Will the Niners reward Jimmy Garoppolo in some way with the same thing? And, and, and does he deserve that? It's, it's a fascinating dynamic Plus, the other thing I want you to hit on, if you're Don Yee and you've represented Tom Brady for 20 years in New England, then you represented Jimmy and he's been in San Francisco, would you advise Jimmy to go back to New England? Two things there. Well, the second one, I don't think he's got a choice, unfortunately for him. I mean, so no release, no trade, nothing? Okay. No, I don't think he has a stay. What if he gets released? he He could mention. Well, if he gets released, that's different, right? Okay. Yeah, then it's then he's going to whoever – pays him the most and gives him a chance to start, which might be the Patriots. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't think Don Yee would step in if that's, if that's the case, if he gets yeah, released. I don't think he'd and the Patriots, unless Jimmy, unless Jimmy said, I'm not going there and pissed and moaned and they threatened to hold out. Right. Which is like, I guess, but I can't, can't imagine. Lord, I mean, Jimmy Garoppolo, can he have, does he have that kind of pull? He just he no, can't. And I can't imagine and that's he would, would do say. that. No, I don't think so either, just given who he is and the respect so stupid, he has for Bill Belichick. Stupid side road for me to well, go Well, no, down. I mean, I, I think it is an important conversation. Like, how much uh, how much do these guys actually – how much input do they have? How much power do they have? Like, Deshaun Watson, I think, has a lot of power. I think he has a lot of leverage because he has that no-trade clause, which the Texans gave him and then alienated the guy to the point that he doesn't want to step on the field for them, which is just – remarkable that they've been able to figure out a way to do that and botch this as badly as they have. And Matthew Stafford had more power than I thought. For instance, um, you know, I just mentioned, I think the Rams, if, if Goff had value, maybe the Rams needed to get a little bit something more back than mm-hmm. just the quarterback that they wanted. How about on the other side of this, Albert Breer reported that the Panthers were offering their number eight overall pick to the lions for Stafford. Those two first round picks that the, that the lions got, 
from the Rams, which might be in the 20s if they're a good team for the next Most two likely. years. Mid to late. Not, not even close to as valuable as a current top 10 pick, especially in a draft where you know there's a lot of quarterback depth and you, oh, by the way, don't have a quarterback of the future. So if they just sent him to L.A. because they wanted to do the guy a solid, what are you doing? Like, we, th- this has to stop. <laughs> Giving all the power to these quarterbacks, you have to make the most – of the guys that you have to, to set yourself up for the future. They, they would have had, the Lions would have had seven and eight overall with the opportunity maybe to go up to number two overall if, the if say, the Jets are sold on Sam Darnold for whatever reason and, and get their next guy and be set up for the future. Instead, they're getting two future picks, which traditionally in trades are worth less. They're worth a full round less depending so that, on how far off the again. Say that again. So if you get a 2022 draft pick, from a team in 2021, if it's a first rounder, it should be points wise regarded as a second rounder. Points wise, and the yeah, based on the trade charts that these teams use, it's about the same value as a second round pick. And now well, a first round period. pick, two years in the future. If we're following that logic, is that then worth a third round pick? So if you traded the equivalent of a second and, and a third to get the quarterback that you want. What's the diff if you're LA yeah, and if you're the Lions? You might not have even how did you know? Yeah. I mean, to me, you're pointing something out to me that is really interesting. If you're the Patriots, look, you can't be Tom Curran and sit there and say that the Rams did what was good for them and smart and then slam the Patriots for making similar moves over the last few years. My criticism of the Patriots isn't that they got aggressive with the Chris Long and Shane McClellan's and Brandon Cooks's at all. My criticism of the Patriots is just whiffing it on their first picks in the draft. But the Rams did do what the Patriots did. And I think that's smart. And you're you're right, Phil. As much as we look at this as an overpay, the longer we scrutinize it, the more we can say, Jesus Christ, what was Detroit thinking? They're going to get the 23rd or 25th best player in next year's draft and the year after when they get that first round pick. So, and now, they got a guy now, that they're just raising. There, and all an their wideouts are up too. Theory. Think about that. Galladay and Marvin Jones are up in Detroit. They have an average quarterback, and they just, you know, have mid-round first rounders. Now they, they can go up, but go ahead. Yeah, they're biding their time, and they'll have listen. They'll have two first-round picks in those years, so they could move up, and they could all of a sudden be. You're right near the top ten of the draft, depending on where they are, or but or even higher than that. I mean, it's the Detroit Lions, so. I think you could argue it both ways. This is obviously this year in particular, while I say it's a strong quarterback class and it looks that way, which I think makes these picks this year even more valuable than they would be normally. Um, You could say, well, it's also, we're still in the middle of a pandemic and college football was barely played in some parts of the country. And so wouldn't you rather have a first round pick in 2022 or in 2023, because there's going to be more certainty with those guys. So you could argue that side of it too. Um, I, I just am dying to know what is Jimmy Garoppolo going to be worth? Because Mm -hmm. you look at it, Tom, there's plenty of teams that need quarterbacks. There's the Colts, the Patriots, and the football team that could all acquire a quarterback making decent money because of the cap space that they have. You could put the Bears into the mix for teams that are looking for quarterbacks, for sure. You know, some of these others that are near the top of the draft, we don't know. I mean, the Panthers Um, must be in the mix. Do the Panthers look – if the Panthers are going to go after – Well, the Panthers could get a guy. Bridgewater. But if they, well, they, if they think that he is that significant a bump up from Bridgewater. But they could get Trey Lance or they oh. could get, I mean, they're in the top 10 of the draft. Those other teams are not. The Patriots are actually in the best position in the draft of those four teams I just mentioned. But Tom, you're talking about, you know, of, of the quarterbacks remaining for those four teams, if you want to handle this position before you get to April, the quarterbacks you're talking about are guys like Garoppolo, if he becomes available, Ryan Fitz. Fitzpatrick, Mitch Trubisky, um, Marcus Mariota, maybe, Jameis Winston. Like Jimmy Garoppolo, you could make the argument that he's the best of that group when healthy. And so he is. Is, is there a bidding war at some point for this guy? And does he end up going for a pick? Like he's probably in a vacuum worth a third or a fourth round pick. But does he end up going for a second or a second plus something else? You because have- there are multiple teams applying for his services. This is the X factor. And this is why I would – Almost say it's better than 50-50 that Jimmy Garoppolo is the starting quarterback for San Francisco beginning at next September. They have to get someone back. They can't vacate the position from Jimmy 
send them someplace and not get something back, or they have to have an answer in house. And I don't know if is Nick Mullins up. I think he is. He might be restricted. I who's think the other dude who started and looked free. halfway? There's another guy. Uh, CJ Beathard. Yeah, Beat Hard didn't look bad. Um, so between Beat Hard, Kyle Shanahan and- makes everybody look good. What? Shanahan makes everybody look halfway decent. Okay, so can you, as the San Francisco 49ers, trade Jimmy without an answer in house? No, I think you'd have to either bring you'd, you'd either have to be trading for Kirk Cousins, who Kyle Shanahan loves. And would save the Vikings a little bit on their cap, but the Vikings aren't going anywhere. They should be willing to trade Kirk Cousins. I know Mike Florio is a big Vikings fan, right? I believe mm-hmm. he, he's yep. followed them for a long time. Um, and he wrote today that you know why would they trade him because there's no upgrade? Well, you're not going anywhere with Kirk Cousins anyway, and you'd save yourself some money. So that would be the argument from Minnesota's standpoint. I think the one problem uh, to trade Kirk Cousins, this or the other thing they could do Cousins, uh, from Mike Florio's article. $35 million of the 2022 base becomes guaranteed March 19th. It's $56 million over two years. So it would save many. They would – I wonder, would it be a wash with Jimmy? Almost? Or no? Kirk Cousins is more expensive than Jimmy, right? Well, almost cap-wise. Yeah, but I think almost cap-wise for this year because that cap Kirk Cousins' cap hit as soon as you bring him on – isn't necessarily, I don't think it's in the thirties. I'd have to look if you okay. traded for him because there's bonus money that the Minnesota would be eating. Right. So it would be almost a wash for, for San Francisco. The other option for them, Tom, would be because they have the 12th overall pick. They're not that far from the top of the draft. They could make a play for, you know, maybe number seven overall. Maybe they call the lions and they say, Hey, you got your quarterback for the next couple of years. We want one from this draft. Give us number seven. We'll give you 12 and we'll give you a future first or something like that. That's their other option if they want to get rid of Jimmy Garoppolo. Okay. Well, if they want to do that, then that means Jimmy goes back to the Lions? Can't have him there, can you? Well, he could be part of that deal, or you or you wouldn't have to you wouldn't you wouldn't have to include him in that. He doesn't have to be part of a of a trade for a pick for a pick like that. All right, Phil, I had no problem with the Patriots not sending a first round pick for Matt Stafford. But I think I'd consider it more strongly for Jimmy Garoppolo. Drunk, am I? Yes, perhaps. I mean, I, that's that would be lunacy to me. Sheer lunacy. And I will tell you why first, and then I want to hear your explanation. Jimmy Garoppolo has been an average at best quarterback when healthy for arguably the best offensive play caller in football with some very good weapons around him. Let's just look at when he was healthy this year. He was one of the shortest throwers in football. He had a he had a solid yards per attempt, average almost eight yards per attempt. But what does that tell you? He's throwing it short, and he's getting it to his playmakers who have either been schemed open or have gotten open on their own, and they have a lot of room to run. And that could mean Jimmy Garoppolo is great at leading these guys, right, of these short little passes. But he is the epitome of a dink and dunk passer in a league that has shown that the more explosive you are, the better offense you are and the better chance you have of winning. Look at the two teams that are in the Super Bowl right now. When it comes to making plays down the field, they're the best in the business. And he's he has just been too average, Tom. And he's old. He's going to be 30 years old in the middle of the next season. Yeah. Can you believe that? It's, it's, it's remarkable to me because he's played so little football. He's missed 23 games over the course of the last three years. You call him Glass Jim. So that's why I... I have to roll my jaw up <laughs> off the floor when you say you'd be willing to give up a first round pick for the guy. I think you'd be crazy to give up. I think you could make the argument based on recent trades. Teddy Bridgewater was traded by the Jets to the Saints for um, a third round pick. I think they also, the Jets also sent a sixth round back. But basically, Jim, uh, Teddy Bridgewater was worth a third. Joe Flacco was traded to the Broncos for a fourth round pick. I think that's the range Jimmy Garoppolo should be in, not the first round conversation. You know that Phil actually had Duke Dawson, Cyrus Jones, Tavon Wilson, and Jordan Richards as second round picks the Patriots have made in the last decade that were better than Jimmy Garoppolo. You can look it up. My contention is <laughs> <laughs> that true. you don't have to get the guy to assimilate quite as much. You, you can bring him in. He knows where the locker room is, and that's huge and important. I know I'm saying that sarcastically, <laughs> but I just think it could be different. And to get that sturdy guy who can probably play for you for four years, I would consider 
a first round pick. Consider. I'd also consider if I sent that talking to Don Yee and reaching out to Jimmy if I got permission and saying, we got to rework your shit when you get out here, buddy, because we're not paying you 24 or whatever he's on the books for. Because you can't do both. So that to me would be a path. If you can say, okay, we got our guy to take us into 2025 and he might get hurt here and there, but he's still a guy and we can start moving to some of the other spots that need work. How about this? Cause I just did a mock draft. So this is fresh in my brain. And I, it was almost like in my own head, because I've been critical of Jimmy Garoppolo. I called him handsome Matt Schaub earlier this year. And that was before he got hurt. I don't know if he's even Matt Schaub at this point. Oh, come on. He's Tom. He's Matt Schaub the Super Bowl. around the league. And been, he's, he was an overthrow. He's had a couple very good Super Bowl. You don't get, do you get credit for, for making the Super Bowl the way that Jimmy Garoppolo made that Super Bowl? Yeah. You do? All right. Then fine. I mean, I, 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 you just you kind of sound like another guy I work with. Jimmy Garoppolo, you think Jimmy Garoppolo is a is a above average NFL quarterback? Yeah, I would say that he is a 5.8. If 5 is dead straight stone cold average, he's 5.8 to 6.2. And is that good enough to win a Super Bowl in today's NFL? It's good enough to hold the position down in a reasonable enough way. The Patriots aren't winning any Super Bowls in the next 3 years. They need the position address. Okay, but do you have to pay a first round pick for that? You have to pay a first round pick for that? The fifteenth overall? I don't it's know. It's too much, Tom. I mean, if I'm looking at Micah Parsons it's too and much. Garoppolo, I think I'll take four years at Jimmy. Why are the why, Okay, well, it, I agree with you there. But why is Kyle Shanahan so I, I read something today that they've expressed confidence in Jimmy Garoppolo recently. They have not. They have said they're fine with him being they their quarterback. Get, they they tried they to get Matt Stafford. They, That's not expressing confidence. They tried to get Matt Stafford. They talked about getting Tom Brady last year. They like they they're not interested. They don't want him anymore. Like that's part of the reason too why they might not do the Patriots as as big a solid on the way back. It's like, okay, well you sent us this guy for a second round <laughs> pick. Who got the better end of that deal? You know, like thanks a lot. They, they've Phil. been actively trying to move on. They're trying to move on. And uh, I think it says a lot because that's a team that's ready to win right now. And they don't think he's capable of taking them where they need to go. So it's too much to me. I would say this though, if the Patriots do give up a second round pick, there is a way you could kind of recoup that. And it's a whole different conversation, but it wouldn't be as painful if say you were able to get a second round pick for Stefan Gilmore, who we both okay. said, we don't necessarily expect to be around next year. So that way you're kind of maintaining your draft capital. You've moved on from a corner who really wants to be paid and you might not be willing to go there because your, your timeline just doesn't match up with his. And maybe you get your quarterback almost in exchange for okay. Gilmore. That, that to me would make more sense. All right. So wherever Bill is on whatever beach, he can be drawing this all out in the sand and we just have to root for no big waves or windstorms to come through and erase all the gymnastics and algorithms that are going to have to be satisfied to make it work for the first round pick. If you gave it up last topic, I want to get to this has been a banged up. Just, I mean, a, a just a banger of a pod impressions from the senior bowl. And Mac Jones specifically. And then I want to hear what's on the next paths this week. Well, so I gave Mac Jones credit just for going to the senior bowl, pure and simple, because I don't think he was going to be able to help himself uh, by what he showed on the field. And, and so to me, he took a little bit of risk. The only thing he could do is show up, prove that he needs the Alabama bubble around him to succeed and go home and all of a sudden become a third or a fourth round pick. Mm -hmm. He didn't do that. He held his own. He was still accurate. He was still a good decision maker. He still, by all accounts, showed, you know, and whatever that's worth, but Justin Herbert got a lot of credit for this last year, being a leader on the field during the week of practice and into the game. Uh, or he didn't play in the game, excuse me, but during that week of practice. Um, so I think he helped himself a little bit just by showing up, by competing, by being able to do some of these interviews, which not a lot of players are going to be able to do this year because of the limitations. But the one thing that he was never going to be able to do, Tom, was show up with a cannon of an arm and, and with 4-3 speed. Like, it's just not who he is. Now these teams have had a chance to really watch him up close with other NFL talent, which they were able to do all during the season. I don't think you learned a lot about Mac Jones except for this. He doesn't necessarily need to be in that bubble. And I think that's a lot of what the question is around Tua Tonga-Vailoa right now because they're, they look different. 
their, their sizes are different. I think two is a little quicker though. He's not fast. Mac Jones is not a great athlete, but they both have mediocre arm strength and they both came from programs where they were surrounded by all-stars. And I think Mac Jones is going to get dinged because of how Tua has looked in his first season. And I'm not sure that's fair. I think Mac Jones, his game is, is different enough. And Tua was so highly regarded last year that Tua, all of a sudden you're okay with taking an accurate quarterback from Alabama, in the top five NFL in, in, in 2019 or 2020, but in 2021, essentially the same guy comes along and because the first guy is screwing up now, Mac Jones is second round pick. So you go, that's the difference in terms of how we're evaluating these guys. That to me doesn't make much sense. I do think a team will eventually take a crack on him in the first round, but I don't know if it should be the Patriots. Cause I, I just don't think he's, I think his ceiling Tom is Kirk cousins. Speaking mm-hmm. of, I think he's Kirk. If he could be Kirk cousins on a rookie contract, that has tons of value. I mean, you could build up your team around that guy. He could succeed with some really good weapons on the outside. We've seen that happen with cousins. He's put up great numbers. Uh, but I just don't think he'll necessarily be a star in the NFL. I don't either. I think the best you can hope for is 10 and two guiding the team, not getting it in major trouble, making good decisions. You know, Colt McCoy is my comp, that kind of player, which is not a bad Ooh. player. It's not, it's, he's not bad. Oh. Come on. He's not bad. But backup. He's a, he's not a starter. He's a, he's not. You can let him start and he can win you a game or two. I don't know if you want to be 16 games year in, year out for four seasons with him, but. That's probably what I think he's going to establish himself as. Would you be? Would you have rather seen Cam Newton or Colt McCoy play quarterback for the Patriots this year? Cam Newton, Colt McCoy. You got to watch more Colt McCoy. Sorry. Get Especially with him. that team, who's Colt McCoy? Who's Colt McCoy throwing to? I mean, that it's looks, gonna, that looks. It's going to end in the same general zip code as the as the receiver. <laughs> I mean, maybe Jacoby Myers scores a receiving touchdown. All right, Phil. What's on the next Pat's podcast this week? Uh, this week, we're, we're going to have a little Tampa Bay Bucks flavor this week. We've got our guy, Trevor Sikama, to come on and talk to us about, because we are draft, he's from the Draft Network, but he's covered the Bucks for a long, long time. And obviously, he's watching everything going on with Tom Brady lately. And so we're going to be talking about Mac Jones. We're going to be talking about styles of quarterbacks and can Brady's style succeed in today's NFL if you're not Tom Brady. Um, we're also going to talk about just the importance of, of having weapons, how that thing in Tampa Bay has been built up and how it was ready to go to drop a quarterback in, because I think that's a path that the Patriots could take in terms of their team building. We're also going to talk a little bit about Jameis Winston, because that guy's available too. And I think he could, if Jimmy's off the table suddenly, because he's staying in San Francisco, I might start making arguments for Jameis Winston to come aboard here, because that guy at least was willing to throw it down the field. And if you put, if you sign a couple guys, maybe you draft a guy high in the draft in terms of weaponry, that might not look as bad as it did in 2020. So uh, plenty to talk about for draft quarterbacks with uh, Trevor Sikkim this week on next pass. I will look forward to that. I'm going to have somebody on to talk about the merits of Colt McCoy as a Patriots starter. That'll be on Thursday in the Patriots talk pod. We've got plenty of great guests who should, should be lined up as well. Uh, appreciate you, Phil. Appreciate Rodney Harrison. Appreciate you, Skull Crusher John Henry. On the production side, we're going to say goodbye.